Good morning and welcome to the third meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2020. And can I remind everyone present to turn off their mobile phones. Uh, agenda item one is consideration of whether to take agenda items five and six in private. Item five is consideration of evidence heard today on building regulations and fire safety. Agenda item six is consideration of our work programme. The committee will also decide whether to take future consideration of its draft report on the period products free provision Scotland bill in private. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you. That is agreed. Agenda item two is consideration of the draft relevant adjustments to common parts disabled persons Scotland's regulation 2020. The committee will first take evidence in the instrument and I welcome Kevin Stewart, Minister for Local Government, Housing and Planning, Angela O'Brien, Housing and Independent Living Team Leader, Scottish Government, and Alison Fraser, Solicitor, Scottish Government. This instrument is laid under the affirmative procedure, which means that the Parliament must approve it before the provisions can come into force. Following this evidence session, the committee will be invited at the next agenda item to consider the motion to approve the instrument. And I invite the Minister to make a short opening statement. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning. Uh, I'm pleased to present the relevant adjustments to Common Parts Disabled Persons Scotland Regulations 2020 for your scrutiny. If approved, these regulations will create a new right for disabled people who live in housing with common areas, such as communal access or a, a garden, to make the relevant adjustment to those areas. I'm also happy to advise the committee uh, that this legislation is the first of its kind in the UK. At uh, present, unless all owners within a development give their consent, a disabled person is unable to make any adaptations, even very minor ones, uh, to those common areas uh, of their property. Section 37 of the Equality Act 2010 gives Scottish ministers the right to make regulations that will allow disabled people to make relevant adjustments, uh, more usually known as adaptations, uh, to the common part of residential properties in Scotland. The regulations before you today uh, will allow disabled people to undertake adaptations to common areas uh, with uh, the support of a majority of the owners within a pr property and will prevent uh, owners unreasonably withholding consent. Uh, where there is a dispute, uh, there will be a right to request adjudication from a sheriff whose decision will be final. Uh, this has been a, a complex project uh, and it has been of primary importance to me that these regulations give disabled people a clear and workable method of securing the agreement of other owners uh, to make those reasonable adjustments uh, within common areas. Uh, a full consultation was conducted in 2011 and at that time 92% of respondents agreed with the proposal to draft the regulations. Since then, my officials have worked with a range of key st stakeholders, including COSLA, disabled people's organisations, and disability groups such as Inclusion Scotland and the Glasgow Centre for Inclusive Living, and expert housing organisations, uh, including Care and Repair Scotland and Housing Options Scotland, on the requirements for the draft regulations and for a practical guide for disabled people. Uh, feedback from a wide range of stakeholders, including the Equalities and Human Rights Commission, have been taken into account by officials when developing the draft regulations. And I'm happy to answer any questions on the instrument, Convener. Thank you very much. Uh, Annabel. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Um, yeah, I have to say this is a very welcome development um, uh, because the, pre the, the current position of requiring unanimity you know, must prove pretty uh, uh, complex. Um, I just note um, that there's a reference to what would happen in the event of, of a dispute that the disabled person or any of the other owners may apply to the sheriff for final decision. Can somebody clarify exactly? Well, hopefully it won't come to that situation now and the majority um, of owners will uh, agree to the adaptation. Uh, but obviously in the case of uh, dispute, uh, it will uh, be the case for a sheriff to adjudicate and that will be the final um, port of call. Um, I'll bring Ms O'Brien in at a point to um, go over some of that in more depth. 
I would like to say, convener, that it's taken us a while to get to this stage because although um, the Equalities Act uh, allowed us to make uh, these changes, we had to gain permission um, from the UK government uh, to make these changes. Um, and it has to be said that that has uh, not been without its difficulties. Um, at one point, uh, I wrote to the then Equalities Minister Amber Rudd only to find her replaced, and we had to rewrite a letter to the new Equalities Minister um, to, to get um, the final permission to get us over the hurdle to get us to this stage. Um, and we have worked through all of this uh, for a long while. But on your point of the Sheriff, uh, I wonder if Ms O'Brien wants to add any more than I've said. Um, we have um, ran, uh, consulted with a uh, Scottish Court Service um, who um, advised that that was the best route to, to take rather than use, uh, for example, the Housing Tribunal Service uh, because it's property related rather than tenancy related. Um, it should be a fairly simple procedure and it, as the Minister said, it would only be in cases where um, uh, there hasn't been any other way of actually uh, being able to um, mediate and resolve the and resolve the issue, but the sheriff's judgment would ultimately be would ultimately be final. That's helpful. Thank you, Andy. Uh, <coughs> yes, could I just clarify the regulation? Because at the in section 11, it talks about the right to adapt rented houses. So to be clear, disabled people living in rented houses will be able to benefit from this, or do they require their landlord to take the relevant action? Uh, on oh, you go, Angela. Sorry. You've started, so you'd be as well <laughs> finished. Sorry. Um, it, it's for people in the private rented sector, um, but they would still need their landlord's uh, permission um, in line with uh, the provisions of the 2006 Housing Act. And so, where a private tenant who requires some adaptations doesn't doesn't obtain the consent of their landlord, do they have the right to appeal to the sheriff? Um, that's something that we would have to uh, that we'll have to consider. Um, but if it's their if it's the if their landlord who is not um, actually given permission, then it's unlikely that it would proceed because it won't proceed now um, if the landlord doesn't give permission. So, so I didn't quite hear the answer to that. If if a, if a if a if a tenant with disabilities wishes to make any adaptations to common parts, will they be able to use this instrument? It relates to the other owners in the property rather than the owner, uh, rather than their landlord. And um, there's existing legislation that, that covers that. They require the permission of their landlord. Right. So a tenant with disabilities who wishes to adapt their property, this doesn't help them. I, I think we should take Ms. Fraser and convener. <coughs> Sorry. Um, sec you don't have to do that. Section 52 of the Housing Scotland Act 2006 provides the right to um, adapt rented houses. So that's for tenants to adapt the, um, the rented house itself. And as you rightly point out, Regulation 11 provides that um, it provides that um, the work carried out under these regulations doesn't cover this so that the 2006 Act, if you like, applies to the work within the house, and these regulations apply to the work outside the house, i.e. to the common parts. If a, if a person with disabilities who is a tenant wishes to make adaptations to the common parts outside and their landlord refuses, they have no rights under this instrument? No, the um, Regulation 3 gives a disabled person who is a tenant the right to make relevant adjustments to common parts. Okay, so tenants are covered just as much as yes. landlords. Yes. Yes. Okay, that's all I was asking. Thanks. Um, and the reason that this was first consulted in 2011 has taken this time is due to the complexity, as you've hinted at. Is that the, as I uh, indicated earlier, there was a complexity in the fact that um, you know we were given the powers, the devolved powers, to deal with this that we had to seek permission to be able to deal with it. Um, and that has uh, uh, added to the complexities. Um, as I said earlier, um, I first wrote to uh, Amber Rudd when she was the Equalities uh, Minister to say that we uh, were seeking the permission to bring this forward. Um, Amber Rudd demitted office um, and we ended up having to write to 
uh, the her successor, um, a baroness whose name escapes me at this moment in time, uh, in order to get uh, that permission. Uh, in so doing, and, and in doing so, we, we, we moved uh, as quickly as we possibly can. This has been a, a situation which, um, while uh, I've myself not seen uh, many uh, cases cross my desk, uh, the ones that I have seen uh, cross my desk from MSPs such as uh, Linda Fabiari um, were causing uh, great grief um, for, uh, for folks who were unable um, to secure um, the agreement of all uh, in the property uh, to deal with the common parts. This, I think, is the logical way forward uh, to deal with these difficulties uh, and hopefully uh, we will not see these kind of things uh, arise again. As I say, we are the first in the UK to move forward in this front. I think it's entirely logical and hopefully uh, will do much to alleviate some of the difficulties that a small amount of folks have faced over the years. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, I've got a few questions, um, and just to sort of follow up on what Andy Whiteman was was asking about. Um, so uh, I'm a little bit confused about if we have a disabled tenant, and yet you need <coughs> a majority of owners to get this through. Why? Why does the why does the tenant have 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 rights? when it needs the owners to actually vote it through? Uh, I, I think, you know, in all of this, what we have found is previously, everybody within a building had to agree to the um, changes to the common parts. Now, what we have found, and, you know, I'll give you the example that I, I've seen myself, where um, a person within a building, um, uh, that adaptation is required. Um, their landlords have no problem with that um, and, you know, uh, most folks within the building have no problem with those changes and yet you can get one person holding out um, their permission uh, and then that would not proceed. This now allows for that majority uh, to allow uh, that to proceed and again, you know, builds in the final decision um, of the sheriff. Now, I know that it's very difficult sometimes for us to understand why it would be that certain folk would withhold permission uh, for something uh, like this, but, you know, that's unfortunately the way the world works at points. This is to iron out this situation, uh, to get to a point of logicality so that these com common adaptations uh, can be made. I, I completely understand that, uh, and that the the decision has to be taken by the owners. So it needs to be a majority of owners. So what I'm trying to get at is if you have a disabled tenant who wants things done to common parts, is it not the case that they still require the go the go ahead of their landlord? So the, the actual request has to come from the landlord. So, so let, let me give, expand further. Uh, I mean, many, in many cases, what you'll find here is you have a situation where there may be uh, shared ownership within that property. So as you're well aware from your council days, uh, as are other members, you have situations uh, where you have had uh, housing which was previously local authority or housing association, for example, um, which uh, uh, has shared ownership now. And it may well be, you know, that the council still has um, the majority ownership within that property. Um, and it may well be that that tenant um, is in a council property at this moment. Council wants to proceed. They've got majority ownership, but because one owner occupier in the past um, has stopped that uh, work from being carried out, that has been detrimental for all, I would say. This will iron out these kind of situations. Can I yes. Sorry. It's, this is about the owners, right? The tenant is, to some extent, superfluous is the wrong word to use, but, but this is about the owner's permission. So if, if there's a tenant with disabilities, they first of all have to get the permission of the landlord, as they would do just now. Yep, uh, and there, and then it just comes into the the owners making a decision before it would then have to go to a sheriff. Yeah, had to go to a sheriff. Uh, would that be it in a nutshell? Uh, if it would be helpful um, to the committee, 
Uh, what we can do is give you a summary of the previous legislation which cover these aspects, uh, which may help you. Is that useful to you, Convener? Great, thank you. Okay. Liam? Yeah. yeah, okay. okay so, so we move on from that. We have a proposal from a tenant, or it might even be an owner who's, who's disabled. Um, that then goes to a, a vote. Um, and, and that could be difficult in itself to arrange that vote. You might not be able to trace enough owners to get a majority. So there's problems there. Those problems exist already uh, not w without this. Um, so let's say that you get your majority. Who, who pays? Who pays for the adjustments? Well, in, in terms of the adaptations, the adaptations themselves uh, may be paid for by the person themselves or, um, as would be the case in, in many uh, situations, the integrated joint boards uh, who are responsible for adaptations uh, would be the ones that would uh, pay, for, pay for them or, in some cases, um, the landlords themselves, um, as Mr Simpson is well aware, may pay for those adaptations. So let's say you've got, let's say there's a private block, private block of flats, and you have a, a, a proposal that goes through, you get your majority, and, and let's say, I, I don't know what kind of adaptations you've got in mind here, but let's say grab rails up the stairs, I don't, I don't know. Um, that, has to be, that has to be paid for. Surely there must, there must be something written down who right. I, I think if, if you look at liability for costs, which is um, at 9 in the bill, 9-1 um, says, unless the disabled person has entered into an agreement with the other owners of the common parts in relation to the sharing of the costs of the relevant adjustments, the disabled person will be solely liable for the costs. 9-2, the cost of the relevant adjustment includes the costs of maintenance and reinstatement. However, um, as the committee will be well aware, in terms of payment for adaptations, integrated joint boards uh, will often pay for adaptations. Um, so it may well be that the disabled person has entered into the agreement uh, with the integrated joint board, with the Health and Social Care Partnership, that they pay for it. So the only way that other owners would pick up any costs of any of that would be if there was an agreement entered into uh, with the disabled person and the other owners. Um, the likelihood is, I would say, um, that in most cases, the adaptation is likely to either be paid for directly by the disabled person themselves or more likely um, by the integrated joint board or um, a council or other body uh, who would normally do such thing. Yeah. Okay, that, that, that's clear enough. So the disabled person uh, would pay for it um, unless other, other owners have agreed to chip yeah. in, basically. Um, can you give us, um, just, so we, just so we're clear on this, sort of examples of the ki kind of adjustments that, yeah, that might be... Might be used. Uh, convener, I think it would be uh, unwise for me to speculate what kind of adjustments uh, uh, there could be. But, you know, we all have come across cases ourselves uh, where, you know, it may be um, a, a ramp to access the property. It may be handrails. Um, it may be something uh, more complex than that. Yeah, uh, but I, so, so, so this doesn't bring in any new descriptions of the types of adaptations that's existing adaptations that we all know about no it's just a the, different the, way the, of this is with it. this yeah. has nothing to do with any new adaptations yeah okay. um, and, and finally um, just back to that delay the consultation was in 2011 and it's taken until now um, Amber Rudd changing jobs doesn't explain that eight-year delay um, perhaps you could expand on that a bit because it's quite a long time. I, I think there's been a, a lot of toing and froing over the piece, uh, much of it uh, prior to, to myself becoming minister. Um, you know, we have moved on this and continued to engage with organisations uh, across the board. Uh, we took the opportunity to ask the UK government to uh, allow us to move forward on this front. We eventually got to that point uh, and we are before you today uh, and hopefully um, you will pass this, um, this SSI so that we can get on with the job uh, of dealing uh, with, and I, sh I stress, 
the small amount of cases where there are difficulties, because at the end of the day, um, you know, many folks have suffered uh, because there has been an inability to move in that front. Great. Thanks, convener. Thank, Thank you. Sarah? Thanks very much. Um, this is welcome, and I was also going to ask a question just asked there about what's included as a relevant adjustment and where that's set out so that people who would like to make those kind of adjustments know where they stand and what's possible. And I was thinking about to what extent they're future-proofed as well, because what we might have thought a decade ago would be a relevant adjustment. Um, have people's aspirations or needs or opportunities changed? So I'm thinking um, whether it's wheelchair access, storage, electric um, wheelchairs or even electric bicycles, there's changes in terms of what people now want. And that's the first question. The second question is um, how this will be publicised to people so that they know what they're now legally allowed to do and who they might get to help them and support them in this process. Um, I think that uh, Ms Boyack comes up with fair point, a fair point about people's expectations nowadays, but this doesn't cover all aspects of expectation. Um, what the, uh, the uh, SSI does, and you can see it for, uh, relevant adjustments include an alteration or an addition to any common parts which affords a means of access to the premises tenanted, owned or occupied by a disabled person or to make the premises suitable for the accommodation or welfare of a, dis a disabled person. Um, so I think we are quite specific in terms of, you know, allowing the entry um, of, of uh, somebody there. Now, I know from my own uh, mailbag that in certain properties at this moment, there are tensions um, around about, uh, for example, as you said, disabled buggies and things like that and where they're parked and all the rest of it. I think, you know, in terms of adaptation for that, uh, that may ne not be um, necessary in terms of access, and I think that's a different matter. Uh, in terms of future, um, and this is where we need to look very carefully in terms of what we're doing in, hu in uh, our housing to 2040 consultation, is to look at what requirements there are going to be um, as we move forward. Obviously, technology changes, um, people's use of different things changes, uh, and we have to take cognizance that uh, what we are going to build in the future uh, is going to be future-proof to allow uh, for certain of these things. This does not cover uh, all aspects of this. It is about that access and egress to a property um, which you know everybody should have a right to do um, using um, uh, whatever uh, means are possible in terms of uh, the uh, handrails, the ramps, whatever it may be. That, that's really helpful clarification. Um, I suppose the issue is that where we are now, getting in and out of your home is your number one issue, but actually once you're outside your home, how do you move to anywhere else? So is that going to be picked up in subsequent regulations, or is that something uh, the government uh, is working on? Convener, I'm here to talk about uh, this regulation yeah, today. Yeah, let's stick o to the SSI. Obviously, um, the government continues uh, to look uh, at all aspects of equality, um, and that's why so much effort has been put in uh, in recent times uh, to come forward with future plans of how we deal uh, with some of the difficulties that disabled people face. Okay, thank you. Alexander? Thank you, Camila. Minister, this, as others have said, is very welcome. Uh, and we've discussed the, the potential of making sure that these individuals get uh, the quality of life that they need to enter their premises or outside their premises. Uh, and as I say, I think that is uh, a step in the right direction. But you indicated that it could be the, the joint board uh, that may fund uh, some of the adaptations that the individuals may require. Uh, and as we're aware, uh, that has implications for uh, the board themselves and their, and their budgetary situation. So when, when adaptations are requested uh, for uh, individuals, uh, it would go forward in the normal procedure uh, and they would decide on uh, the response, uh, whether that is acceptable. And if, if we get the regulation and that, then, then, then they would get a rail or they would get an adaptation to uh, the garden or something along those lines. Uh, but is there any anticipation as to the, the financial implications that boards will then have to in, endure uh, to ensure that these adaptations are uh, 
uh, then uh, taken forward uh, and, and supported. Uh, convener, as I've said to this committee previously when I've been asked questions about integrated um, joint boards, in my opinion, um, you know, the best thing uh, that IJBs can do in order um, to save money uh, and also uh, to stop the human cost that occurs uh, when adaptations are not put in is to actually deal uh, with all of this as preventative spend. Um, you know, I've made no bones about that here. I've made no bones about it elsewhere. Um, I've been frustrated at points myself in my own constituency where I've had to argue with um, Health and Social Care Partnership um, that by doing a certain thing, they're likely to save themselves uh, a lot of money. Now, in all of this, before we get to um, the point of the uh, person using this, the likelihood is that it already have been agreed uh, what is required for that person's need uh, by an occupational therapist. And one would hope um, that after that OT has made their recommendations, um, that the resource would be found to do this. I think in some regards, we um, may be overcomplicating this to a degree, um, uh, convener. Um, I, I'm always uh, glad to be scrutinised in, in these regards. But what I can, uh, uh, in, in all honesty, do is answer every question about every aspect of uh, health and social care partnerships today um, and how they resource um, these kind of things when I'm dealing uh, with this uh, regulation only. Uh, but uh, I would reiterate what I've said previously, that I think spending money um, on adaptations um, actually uh, would save uh, health and social care partnerships a lot of money and also would save uh, a lot of grief for the folks who need these ad adaptations. Uh, questions based on the knock-on effect of it, but at the end of the day, we are here to discuss the SSI. And on that point, Andy? Yeah, just a very brief question. I think you mentioned in your opening remarks that you'd uh, sought the permission of the UK government. The, the Equality Act provisions under 37.3 require you to have consulted a Minister of the Crown. Um, the UK government was never implying that they could withhold permission, were they? I mean, your statutory duty was merely to consult. Um, I will get back to Mr uh, Whiteman and the committee about the full detail of this. Uh, can I just say that in some regards, some of this is never easy, um, shall we say, uh, where um, I think at points logic goes out of the window. Uh, but I'm more than willing to share with the committee uh, the timeline of communication that I've had with UK ministers on this issue. Yeah, it's not, it would it just be, would be interesting because there's, a, there's a quite a wide range of uh, powers that ministers have here that require them to consult, and what, what is consultation uh, would be useful to bottom out. Um, your experience would be interesting in that regard. Uh, well, I'm more than willing to, to uh, share with the committee uh, how we move forward in that front. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Annabelle, you had talked to you. Just really going back to the issue earlier, I mean, obviously, the, the, the issue of alterations as uh, on the part of a tenant is a matter governed by the lease document as between the tenant and the landlord. Uh, and I would imagine in the event of a disabled tenant that there would be <coughs> provision requiring the landlord to grant consent, but equally that that consent shouldn't be unreasonably withheld, and that would be the normal legal position as a matter of Scots law. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, in that case, I think we've exhausted the, the questions, hopefully not the Minister, uh, and uh, we'll move on to agenda item three, which is a formal consideration of motion S5M 20243, calling for the Local Government and Communities Committee to recommend approval of the draft re relevant adjustments to common parts, Disabled Persons Scotland Regulation 2020. Minister. Uh, uh, moved, uh, convener. Thank you. Uh, any contributions from the members? No, in that case, can I just ask one follow-up from Sarah Boyack was about publicity. I should have asked you just prior to it about publicity for this. Will you be making sure that the public know what the, the change of the laws is? Um, convener, I'll have discussions with officials about how we can move that forward. Uh, but also uh, what I, I would say is we will make uh, good use uh, of the offices of the likes of Housing Options Scotland who are very good at uh, getting out word um, that uh, there uh, has been a, a change in the law. Um, so we'll 
not only look at what we can do ourselves, but we'll also see uh, what we can uh, get in terms of help from, from other bodies who uh, have uh, the contacts uh, with uh, lots of uh, disabled people. Thank you very much. I certainly hope that's not me. Oh, well, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there you go. Uh, okay, and can I ask you now to sum up, Minister? Uh, I have nothing to say. Thank you. Indeed. The question therefore is that motion S5M20243, in the name of the Minister for Local Government, Housing and Planning, be approved. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that is therefore agreed. The committee will report on the instrument in due course, and I invite the committee to delegate authority to me as convener to approve a draft of the report for publication. Thank you very much. And I will now pause briefly to allow a changeover of officials. Thanks. Agenda item four, the committee will take evidence on building regulations and fire safety. The committee concluded an inquiry into this matter earlier this session, but agreed to maintain a watching brief on it, as policy and practice continues to evolve in the light of lessons learned from the Grenfell Tower tragedy. During today's session, we will also consider issues relevant to Petition 1719 concerning the stay-put fire safety policy in tall residential buildings, which was referred to the committee in November 2019. And I welcome back Kevin Stewart, Minister for Local Government, Housing and Planning, and his officials, Stephen Garden, Head, Head of Building Standards Division, and Chris Booth, Policy Officer, Fire Rescue Unit, Scottish Government. And I invite the Minister to make a short opening statement. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Convener, uh, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to update the Committee uh, on the Scottish Government's uh, Ministerial Working Group on Building and Fire Safety, uh, which was, of course, immediately formed uh, by the First Minister after uh, the Grenfell tragedy. Um, we've made uh, significant progress uh, since I uh, last appeared before you in September 2018 on this particular issue. On the 1st of October 2019, 
um, we published revised fire safety standards and guidance. Uh, this included measures to improve the safety of external cladding on high-rise buildings. Any building over 11 metres in height uh, now requires any cladding system uh, to be non-combustible or to have passed a large-scale test. We have also extended these requirements to all hospitals, residential care homes, entertainment and assembly buildings, uh, regardless of height. Uh, retaining the testing route has raised <coughs> questions uh, from the committee uh, and from certain industry parties. Uh, in retaining the BS8414 test uh, is an alternative. I have followed the recommendations of the Scottish Government's Fire Safety Review Panel, uh, chaired by Dr Paul Stollard, who provided evidence, evidence to you back in 2018. Uh, cladding performance is only part of managing fire in buildings, uh, and that is why we have also introduced uh, requirements for two escape stairs, evacuation sounders and floor and dwelling <coughs> indicator signs in new high-rise buildings. And we will also introduce further requirements for sprinklers uh, from 2021 to extend to all flats and all new social housing. Uh, we have also introduced further fire safety measures through legislation to require all homes to have smoke, heat and carbon monoxide alarms with effect from February 2021. Uh, to assist, we have made interest-free loans available to housing associations, uh, which has so far loaned over £4.5 million. We have also produced the practical fire safety guidance aimed at those responsible uh, for high-rise uh, housing and produced fire safety leaflets uh, for residents which, were, uh, which are being delivered uh, to all high-rise homes. Uh, we have updated the compliance guidance uh, in particular, uh, drawing greater awareness of checks needed on safety critical elements. Uh, the Building Standards Futures Board was formed last year to oversee a programme intended to deliver greater levels of compliance and a better performing system. I'm acutely aware of the issues that there are around mortgage lending and high-rise properties with cladding and recognise the anxiety that this is causing uh, to homeowners. And I've been clear uh, that I want to see swift action taken to resolve this issue. Uh, we cautiously welcome the launch of the new assessment process, that's Forum EWS1, announced by the industry last month, and hopefully that will help to resolve these issues. My officials have held discussions with UK Government, UK Finance, the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, the Property Manage, uh, Managers Association and uh, MSPs and others, uh, and will continue to do so uh, until we arrive at a satisfactory resolution. Uh, we acknowledge uh, the, the report uh, on uh, phase one of the Grenfell Inquiry, uh, which was published late last year. I've met with uh, officials who are reviewing the recommendations and there will be a report to the Ministerial Working Group uh, on the 4th of February. Um, I hope, convener, that this short overview uh, demonstrates the Scottish Government's commitment to taking any necessary action to make Scotland's building even safer than they currently are. Thank you, convener. OK, thanks very much for that, Minister. Uh, I've got a couple of questions. We had sort of two different approaches from witnesses uh, in front of us about how to deal with the fire safety in complex buildings such as high-rise. One was based on increasing the competence or regulation of those involved in fire safety, and the other based on removing the scope for human failure through stricter regulation and the use of safety factors. Which approach does the Scottish Government favour in developing building standards? Uh, Convener, I think it, we've got to look at all aspects of this. Um, I've followed very closely some of the uh, evidence that has been given to the committee. Um, but beyond that, um, you know, I too, like the committee, have received uh, various communications from various bodies uh, around about what they think is, is the best way forward. Now, obviously, um, in some cases, um, the folks who are writing to us obvi obviously have an interest in moving one way rather than another. 
Um, and I think we have to take cognizance of all of that as we move forward. Um, I have been quite clear um, um, in all that we have done is that we will look very carefully at all that is presented to us. Um, you know, we took the bold steps at a very early stage uh, to put together um, the uh, groups who were looking at fire safety and building standards. Um, we uh, had on those groups experts, not only um, uh, who are nationally known, but folks who are internationally renowned as well. Um, and we will continue uh, to listen to the views of people um, as we move forward, um, because I do not want a situation um, where we are taking uh, rash decisions um, in certain areas based on evidence from maybe just one or two parties. We have to listen to all. Uh, we have to look closely and analyse what is being said and move forward in that front. That is what we have done thus far in terms of implementing the recommendations that have come forward uh, from those that were looking at fire safety and those that were looking at building standards. Can I ask them, what do you say to those that raise concerns about the fire safety expertise being concentrated on value engineering with a view to minimising the costs in current fire safety standards? rather than producing the safest of buildings? What, what I will do is I'll take Mr Garvin in first and then I will make comment on that, um, convener, because obviously Mr Garvin uh, has greater expertise in these things uh, than myself. Okay. Thank you, Minister. Um, within the building standards system, uh, the, the, uh, the system is preemptive, so uh, the, the designs, the, the specifications, etc., are approved in relation to the to the building standards, building regulations. So any value management, value engineering exercise cannot compromise that. Uh, and any changes that occur, uh, either after the approval is given or during the construction, should be subject to, to amendments, amendments to warrant. Uh, so any work that's done any design, any construction work has to be compliant with the regulations and that way uh, we can uh, safely uh, well, require that, that, that the building at the end of the day is, is safe uh, one, once it's completed. So uh, whatever exercise around value management are, are carried out shouldn't compromise the, the safety. On that point, that's suggesting that what we have to do is you have to build according to the standards that have been set, right? But what if the standards have been set in a way that are taking into account both cost and safety, right? Because, and that happens in almost everything we do. What I'm saying here is, what is the balance? Is, is the, you know, making it safer more important than having it safe, but not as safe as it possibly could be. C convener, if I can maybe come in there, because um, in terms of what we have done thus far, uh, we have looked at safety. Um, for example, um, you know, there was a debate uh, amongst the fire safety um, expert panel about uh, two staircases. Um, and the majority um, came out uh, if I remember rightly, in favour of two staircases, but there was dispute um, around about whether that was entirely necessary or not. Now, I, um, uh, in terms of the formulation of the new regulations, said that you know we what we actually require is that two stair staircase solution. You know, I want to make sure um, that people here in Scotland are as safe as they possibly can be, and that our buildings are as safe as they possibly can be as we move forward. Um, now, you know, there have been, for example, um, at, at the committee, um, various things that have been said about aspects um, of BS 8414, um, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, there has been questions by some uh, around about that fire testing. But again, we took the evidence from the Building Standards Fire Safety Review led by uh, Dr. Stollard, uh, which supported the continued use of BS 8414 as a, an option. Um, uh, there has been discussion uh, by some uh, around about desktop exercises um, during the course of the evidence that you've taken. Um, and that term has been 
uh, commonly used to describe an assessment in lieu of a fire test. But that has never been recognised or supported as a route to compliance with Scottish building regulations. And I think where we all want to get to is a place where we can make folk as safe and secure as possible. Thank you for that. That's encouraging. But just on the last point, and, <coughs> and I suppose it, it, it leads on from my previous question, some concerns were raised about the <coughs> fire safety and building standards being focused on ensuring evacuation before collapse, when it should focus on minimising the impact on a fire in the building. Now, are you saying that, particularly public buildings which serve important social functions, are you saying that the, 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 there's a change in the, the focus now to make sure that you're, you're going to minimise the impact on a fire in the building so that such a thing has happened in Grenfell, for example, can't happen? I, I think we've always sought to minimise um, fire spread um, uh, in terms of particularly high-rise properties. I, I mean, they were built in such a way or should have been built in such a way of, um, of compartment compartmentalisation. That's not a word I'm very good at, sorry, convener. Um, whereby if a fire did break out um, in a high-rise building, it was contained within um, that uh, that particular area of the building. So you wouldn't that. A description of evacuation before collapse. Um, I, I don't know who has used that, that phrase. One, of, I, one I, of our previous witnesses. Okay, um, I, that's not one I have seen. Right. Okay. Um, I have to say, but you know, one of the things uh, which we'll probably cover in some depth um, is the stay put situation. Um, versus an evacuation situation. What we have here in Scotland is a situation where um, the Fire and Rescue Service um, still advocate that stay put situation, uh, whereby you know evacuation should only take place when um, folk are instructed to ev evacuate, because the integrity um, of that high rise um, should be as such uh, as to be able to, to stop that spread. Now, I know that we have seen something uh, different uh, at Grenfell and the tragedy there. Uh, but, you know, um, I, I think as we move forward, we will get to grips and realise exactly what the circumstances were there and the difficulties were there compared um, to, to what um, the standards uh, have been um, uh, here in Scotland. Uh, I will bring in Mr Garvin because obviously, again, um, a lot of this is technical, convener. I think what the Minister set out is, is the situation exactly for, for high-rise housing, indeed, uh, blocks of flats generally, so compartmentation and ensuring that, that the, the fire is contained in uh, the, the area of origin as much as possible. Uh, and evacuation in that respect is only uh, an issue once, once that compartmentation is, is breached, but obviously that's a a matter for the fire service in, in tackling that, that fire. Uh, other types of buildings, for example, schools, would be about uh, getting people out who are occupying the school uh, first and foremost, but remember that we also set requirements for sprinklers in schools, uh, which should help to, to contain uh, any fire outbreak as well. Okay, thank you, Sam. Yeah, thanks very much. We've, we've focused a lot about the design of buildings and materials up to this point. Um, I want to pick up on the issue that was raised by Professor Torero in his evidence, which was about the skills and knowledge of those who are involved in the process, and particularly to address the issue of building industry fire safety professionals. Should they be certified and regulated, as happens in many other professions? And I'm keen to get the view from the Minister or Mr Garvin about that. Where is the Scottish Government currently on that issue? <laughs> I'll let Mr Garvin come in first and then I'll uh, follow up, convener. Yeah. So I think um, we, we recognise the, the, the points made uh, by, by Professor uh, Torero and uh, I think it, it's uh, the, the following the Grenfell Tower fire, the recommendations that, that were made in Dame Judith Hackett's report to uh, for England uh, cover issues around both people and indeed uh, construction products as well. And these are issues that go across the UK. Um, so we're, we're uh, 
conscious of the work that's that's going on uh, and uh, monitoring and liaising on that work uh, with regards to the the licensing of uh, contractors uh, and the, the the skills and competence of the the profession as well to do that. Um, I think it's important for us to then it's how do we take that within the building standards system and, and, and use it to, to best effect uh, uh, so that we, we ensure that people with the right skills and competence are, are carrying out the work. I think it's fair to say that both, um, uh, whether it's on the design professions or the construction side, that there are there is uh, professional routes there. there there's, there's training available for installers, there's SVQs, etc. Uh, we need to ensure that... that uh, construction clients through contracts uh, and through controlling of people who are coming onto the site to carry out work are, are competent to uh, to do that work. So, in appointing subcontractors, for example, that they are experienced in the uh, in the systems that they're installing, uh, and the proper supervision and checking of that 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 work is carried out. So, some of this sits within the building standards system. Others sits within the responsibility of clients to uh, and, and others to get the, the job right. I think beyond that, and uh, Mr. Garvin hasn't covered this, um, is that we also need to look at the um, the workforce uh, that are involved in building standards itself. Um, largely, what we have at this moment, um, uh, and uh, I hope I'll be excused for saying this. Um, is uh, uh, an, an older workforce. We need to bring new folk in uh, to play uh, here. Uh, and we also actually need to ensure um, that we uh, build in resilience uh, to, uh, to, to, to this particular area of business. Um, and the Local Authority Building Standards uh, Scotland is, is currently developing uh, and testing a, a new competency, competency assessment system uh, to uh, uh, assess every member of staff that's currently involved to as as assess their skills and to identify gaps. Uh, beyond that, uh, we're looking at how we can attract more uh, folk uh, into uh, this area of business because, again, you know, there have been difficulties over the years um, in terms of, <coughs> excuse me, recruitment, uh, and we want to, to show um, folks that this is uh, the kind of, uh, of career uh, that they should consider and we need to get the right folks involved um, in the verification process processes as well. Um, beyond that, I think the committee are already aware um, that the government is looking um, at skills within the construction sector um, as a whole. Uh, and we had Professor Stephen Smith um, from Heriot Watt recent, uh, University, who has reported to us recently uh, on a number of these issues. That's very useful because it is actually <coughs> about uh, the commissioning of the works, the clients, um, the people that are designing, then it's the inspections, um, it's the actual construction, and then it's the inspection of the construction. So I suppose the challenge is at every single stage in that process we're confident we've got qualified and skilled people. So I suppose I'm I'm listening to bits of answers that do take us through some of those issues. Is there a is that report going to be available publicly? And you're going to respond to the a report I think you said by was it uh, Professor or Mr. Smith, just to make sure that we're actually running through. The question is that we're running through all those aspects of all the people involved, and then the accountability process. Um, and just to finish on this one, we've talked a bit about who's involved in the process in terms of skills, what more needs to be done there. But finally, just to go back to that, checking that work has been done properly in terms of meeting the building regulation standards, where you've changed them, awareness about that, and just to make sure that the certification is clear. And it is to question about what's happened um, since Grenfell in terms of the changes you've made, um, particularly in terms of compartmentalisation. You know, that issue where an owner potentially changes a door and has no, no idea that they have just made that whole floor vulnerable. So it's just about the awareness of this. And one of the things the committee had recommended previously 
was the greater use of Clark of Works. So it's trying to think through all of those different stages and potentials so that everybody who could be involved knows what they're meant to be doing and doesn't do something inadvertently. Um, there are a lot of questions in there, convener. Yeah. I'll try and cover um, as much of that as, as I can. If I miss anything, Miss Boyack uh, may want to come back. Let's deal with some of the latter ones first. In terms of um, the compart compartmentalisation, I shouldn't have attempted that again. Uh, let's talk about fire doors. Um, you know, we have a different regime here um, in terms of fire doors uh, compared to those sites of the border where a fire door um, has to have, what's the correct terminology in terms of the 60 minutes? 60 minute fire door resistance, yeah. Okay, I, at that simple, I should have just said what I thought it was. 60 minutes of fire resistance here compared to 30 minutes of fire resistance um, south of the border uh, as was. Um, what we have done since the Grenfell tragedy, and obviously um, we have relied on partners to do this as well, um, is uh, to have an overview, uh, to go and look and see uh, what actually uh, is the case uh, in, uh, in, in uh, high-rise buildings uh, across the country. We've had the cooperation um, from many local authorities and housing associations uh, in doing um, all of this. Um, and I don't know, convener, um, but um, certainly uh, in my own home patch, I had uh, certain folk on at me uh, moaning that they were having to pay for replacement doors um, because they had removed doors themselves without permission. Uh, so I'm confident that, in, uh, that, that these checks are being carried out. But again, uh, we cannot be complacent in all of this. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why um, we are putting together the inventory of high-rise buildings uh, and so that we can take that overall check um, on an annual basis of what ch changes have been made to that building uh, and what, um, what, what effect that, that that may have. So I, I'm confident around about some of that. I should also, um, a, as well as thanking housing associations and local authorities for all of that work, uh, should thank the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service for the work that they've been doing in terms of making folks um, in high-rise buildings uh, aware um, of the situation. Um, we have... Uh, at this moment in time, a leaflet going out um, to every um, uh, residence in high-rise buildings across Scotland, um, uh, uh, making them aware of fire safety issues. Um, I think that that exercise, um, which started at the beginning of this month, is almost complete. I think you gave me a number of earlier on of how many buildings still had to be done, Chris. It was about 100 There's by about the end of the month. 100 still to do which will be completed before the end of the month. And, you know, I think it is absolutely essential um, that we continue um, to um, liaise uh, with residence groups and with uh, folks living in high-rises as we move forward and as, uh, as we make um, any uh, changes uh, at all. Uh, and, of course, in all of that, we have to listen to what they have to say too. Um, uh, uh, I think... Some of the other things that Ms. Boyack uh, mentioned in her questions was around about the uh, Harriet Watt report. That is already public, um, but we will uh, we will send you uh, the committee all of the details of that, and of course the the government um, will look uh, th uh, through all of those recommendations and move forward appropriately. Um, I think one of the other things uh, which was touched upon is around about uh, construction itself. Um, we are looking at our own construction handbooks um, and trying to ensure that we get all of that absolutely spot on right. And beyond that, I think uh, Ms. Boyack talked about uh, procurement. Again, we are looking at our own procurement handbooks uh, around about how we procure. Uh, as we move forward um, because there are ways and means uh, using uh, procurement and using our own uh, 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 construction handbooks uh, which uh, can set a, a course um, for improvement. Obviously, in all that we do in that front, uh, we'll continue to talk to partners around about that too uh, and move towards um, uh, uh, the improvement uh, there too. Um, my final point would be around about Clark of Works. Uh, because the committee is very well aware 
uh, that my own personal opinion um, is that where um, clerk or works are in place, whether that be in a housing project, um, whether that be um, a, a, any other uh, project, um, I, uh, in, in talking to folk as I'm out and about, uh, find that it seems that things have moved much more smoothly um, and, and uh, you get to a point where it's not even a case of, um, you know, uh, anything big really. Even a small snagging lessens, um, I've found, if you've got a clerk of works um, on site. That's really useful. And I would just pick up that point that uh, welcome that leaflet going out to um, people in high rise buildings. That enables um, local community groups to actually come together and read those leaflets and promote awareness alongside all the official work that's going on. I think that's incredibly important. And I think for us as MSPs, that's actually quite useful to know that's gone out. I think beyond that, convener, and I think Miss Boyack is absolutely right. And, you know, uh, we need to continue to have discussions with folks who are living in high rise buildings about um, what their uh, hopes and aspirations and maybe their fears are as well. Um, and we need to take cognizance of what they have, have to say. I've met with a number of residence groups from many high rises um, across the country and, and in terms of uh, some of the, uh, the the work that we have done um, uh, it has been their their comments their ideas that have led to some of those things uh, being moved forward uh, and I think you know uh, as we continue on uh, I would my expectation that would would be that we continue to have those discussions with folk that local authorities uh, landlords um, uh, uh, do exactly that. Um, and uh, uh, I think that in all that we do, um, you know, listening and moving forward in that front is absolutely essential. Okay, thank you. Before I bring Graham Smith in, can I ask, that, uh, has the government had uh, any interaction with local authority building standards Scotland? Um, we have, uh, I'll, I'll let Mr. Garvey, yeah, he's yeah, nodding yeah. vigorously there, yes, I'll let him yes, come yes. in in a second. Um, yeah, we, we, we talk to labs a lot. I myself uh, meet with labs on a fairly regular basis, although it's been a while since uh, I, I last uh, spoke to them. I've attended their conferences um, and faced the questioning from them there. Um, I, I think uh, uh, that is uh, maybe appreciated as well. Uh, but yeah, there's constant communication between building standards and labs and with individual local authorities. Obviously, um, as the uh, committee is well aware, uh, in terms of the verification powers, I decided as minister that we would do things somewhat differently um, in terms of uh, the different years given to folk, uh, depending on what standard that we're at. So there's constant monitoring and constant communication between um, building standards between local authorities and, of, of course, labs. Uh, beyond that, during the course um, of the summer, uh, where some folk may think I have a little bit more time in my hands, which is not always the case, um, I visited um, building standards um, folks in Stirling uh, to see a, a, a piece of work there that was uh, going on on site. Um, and spent uh, a, a fair amount of time um, in Inverclyde looking at a new build and what building standards were doing there and uh, a refurbishment of a building just so that um, I've got uh, some of the things which I'm not so sure about at points uh, in my head and to, to, to try and gather up the, the knowledge from the experts on the ground. Do you want to add to that, Stephen? I think... Minister covered uh, most things. The, uh, we do work with labs on a day-to-day -day basis, pretty much, and they're fully involved in uh, initiatives that were t underway in terms of building standards futures board and the program there. Uh, the uh, labs have already done a lot of work on the uh, workforce side, training, qualification, uh, and we're supporting them in developing that uh, and looking to the development of a building standards workforce strategy. Uh, so that's very much part of the, the Futures Board programme, uh, which we are expecting uh, we'll be able to launch in the spring. 
and hopefully the Minister will launch that in, uh, in the spring uh, and really kind of set in a, a way forward with, uh, for, the profession, for the workforce, uh, getting more people into the, into the system, getting them trained, etc. Can I, can I say one thing to you I, 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 if I may, if you could indulge me, because sometimes we concentrate on the negativity and, and things. Um, and one of the one of the um, uh, local authorities that was not performing well in terms of building standards uh, was Stirling, um, who have improved greatly. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to, to, to go and see what they were up to. Uh, beyond that, they have got um, a, a fairly uh, good scenario going on where they are attracting young folk um, into building standards. And I think, you know, that uh, uh, some of the work that they have done could be emulated elsewhere. It suggests that labs have got an important role to play. Uh, and it would have been nice to have had them in front of the committee, but we have invited them a few times and they've, they've not responded yet. So we'll maybe, if we're doing another session, we'll try our hardest to get them to come here. Okay, thank you, Graham. Yeah, thanks, thanks, convener. Um, uh, labs, labs have been before the committee. Well, I think once, once before, um, when we uh, produced our original report on this. Um, can I just mop up um, a, a, on a couple of questions that have already been asked? Um, so, just on the verification uh, and your dealings with councils, are there any uh, any councils that are still, in your view, not performing well enough? Um, Convener, we continue to uh, monitor all of this as we move forward and the, the committee will be aware um, that at points where, uh, you know, I was uh, not so happy um, about what was going on, uh, we did reduce um, the uh, amount of time that uh, local authorities had the verification powers. Beyond that, um, we had the agreement uh, with uh, Edinburgh uh, that we would move in uh, a number of experts to give them uh, a helping hand uh, to ensure that they were uh, back uh, on track. And again, you know, if anybody uh, feels that there is any difficulties, uh, we are uh, more than happy uh, to help them uh, with additional expertise um, over uh, the piece. Um, what we have seen uh, in the main um, is improvement. Um, and uh, off the top of my head, I kind of remember uh, all of it, but some of the uh, councils who had a lesser amount of time um, in terms of the powers have had that increased. I think we increased Sterling from uh, to two years, did three two years. years. Um, it, Glasgow, Glasgow to three years. Glasgow to three and Edinburgh two. Edinburgh two. Those are the three councils I was thinking. Uh, absolutely. So, so I, I think what we have seen in Stirling um, is fairly substantial improvement, as in Glasgow. Um, I think in terms of uh, Edinburgh, um, you know, we've given that help in hand. They are on the road to improvement. Certainly, from my own perspective, um, when I'm out and about. I get uh, a, a lot less complaints uh, about the situation here than I previously did. But, you know, um, we get regular updates of where we are at uh, and uh, in their performance. That's not just entirely based on the time taken either, because uh, we can get fixated in some of that uh, as well. But we'll continue to monitor that as we move forward. So, um, I mean, Maybe you could just write to us with a bit more detail around that. that, sure, that that's not a problem. Rather than answering it now. Um, just on, going back, I don't want to focus on this leaflet too much, but um, Mr. Booth, you said there were just 100 high-rises still to do. Are these are these just housing association properties and councils? The majority of them were uh, um, housing associations, yeah. They're, no, they're not private blocks? Some of them were private as well. They're not all private blocks? No. They? Included, so yeah. there'll be a, a, a large number uh, of high-rise blocks in Scotland that, that don't get this. No, no, sorry. Um, there was a, a huge number of them sent out in December, um, based on uh, figures that we had from the partially completed high-rise inventory, 
and then a further number of buildings, which are these ones were identified in late December. Um, so we're sending out further leaflets to them this month. So there are about 43,000 delivered before the end of the year, and there's been a further four to 5,000 delivered this, this month. And they should be delivered to every flat and every high-rise building in Scotland by the end of this month. That includes private. That includes all, all uh, ten years. Yes. And your definition of a high rise is any building over eighteen meters. Eighteen meters. Okay. Sorry, any domestic building over eighteen meters. Right. Okay. Well, I'll I'll, I'll look forward to receiving that. Then. So we are uh, commissioning research um, as well to uh, make sure that the leaflets have been uh, received by people, and then also asking questions about how they feel about the information in the leaflet as well. I'll be happy to feed back to you if you want to ask me if I've received it at the end of the month, and I'll okay. tell you. Um, you can tell us if you haven't. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, Make sure you search everything as it comes through the letterbox. You didn't want to uh, to say, and I got it, and it's hidden in a pizza leaflet. Uh, but hopefully that won't be the case. A absolutely, Minister. I'm very uh, meticulous about that sort ah, of thing. Good. Um, so can we um, sort of go, go back to what uh, I think we're here to talk about, so sort of fire safety. Uh, so I'm going to ask you about um, cladding now uh, and the test, that, which you've mentioned uh, earlier, the BS April 1-4 test. Um, earlier this month, uh, well, the 13th of January, actually, uh, a ban, an absolute ban on combustible cladding materials uh, came into force in Wales um, and that was on all blocks of flats, um, uh, care homes and hospitals over 18 metres in Wales. Um, and the, the housing minister in Wales, your counterpart Julie James, said that, that that ban leaves no room for doubt as to what is suitable uh, in those properties. Uh, the ban there applies to all new buildings and to existing buildings that are being refurbished. Uh, and we've had a, a similar ban uh, in England which <coughs> came in into force in December 2018. So all combustible cladding materials. That doesn't appear to be the case in Scotland. So why is, why is that? Um, convener, as I said earlier, we put together a panel of experts to <coughs> look at all aspects uh, of fire safety um, uh, chaired by Dr. Paul Stollard. Um, that panel supported the continued use of BS 8414 um, as an option to inhibit um, fire spread and compliance uh, with building regulations. And we have followed their expert advice. Um, the, the requirement uh, for cladding on high-rise buildings in Scotland is that it meets uh, European classification A1 or A2, um, effectively non-combustible or uh, does, not does not contribute uh, to fire growth, or that it passes that large-scale uh, fire test known as BS8414. Uh, in retaining the option to test cladding systems, uh, we have followed those recommendations by uh, those uh, fire experts. Um, and as was set out by witnesses um, at uh, your meeting on the 20th of November, uh, while cladding is clearly important, um, there is more uh, uh, of a, a fire risk uh, uh, of a, uh, to a building than that, just that one element. Um, however, I do recognise uh, that whatever route to compliance that we take, um, there also needs to be robust verification. Uh, hence, the ongoing work to reinforce the roles and the responsibilities uh, of those involved in delivering buildings, uh, and of course, how all of that is evidenced. Um, and my officials can provide uh, more work uh, uh, more information about work in this area if the committee uh, wants that. But that um, is where we're at. We followed the um, recommendations of that expert panel. Um, I recognise that, you know, during the course of your um, uh, deliberations with other witnesses, um, some folks um, were in agreement around about this, uh, others uh, uh, not. Uh, but what I would say to the committee 
um, is that the BS 8414 test is respected globally and that the European Commission um, are currently adopting BS 8414 um, as the basis uh, for a large-scale fire exposure condition um, in the European uh, Harmonised Fire Test Standard. The committee will also be aware, I'm sure, that um, the British Standards Institution uh, had a call for evidence around about uh, the uh, BS 8414 uh, in the summer of 2019. Um, the committee that are responsible uh, for all of that, uh, which are again are experts and are independent of government, um, they're currently considering 200 pages of public comments um, and obviously uh, we would want to look and see what they come up with in terms uh, of a revised standard. Uh, we will continue uh, to take a look at all of this, take cognizance of the views uh, of the experts um, as we move forward. Would you accept, though, that the, the ban that exists in England and Wales is stricter than exists in Scotland? I, I don't necessarily accept that there is a, a, a stricter regime in some regards for the simple reason that in all of this, uh, in terms of the use of BS 8414, you're testing an entire system, uh, whereby the emphasis in certain places has been on one aspect of that system. And I'll maybe bring Mr Garvin in uh, because obviously he has much more expertise than I do in that front. Yeah. So uh, the 8414 test that is, is based, as, as we know, on a large scale uh, test, and it's testing many aspects of the, or all aspects of the, the, the cladding system. Um, and it's uh, recognised the, 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 the severity of that test is, is greater than other similar large-scale tests on an international basis. So uh, it, it's, it's also stepped up from the, the intermediate-scale tests uh, and um, systems that are uh, that, 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 that passed the test and, and have been demonstrably shown to, to pass the test and, and certified. Uh, we, we don't have uh, any evidence that, that they have failed in practice. So testing carried out on the sorts of materials in installed at Grenfell, for example, uh, at BRE, failed that, they clearly failed it, and, and they failed quickly. So we, we know that that's, that, that, that's the case. And, and clearly, uh, any, any system that fails a test should not be used on any building now in Scotland above 11 metres, uh, and, and previous, uh, up until last October, uh, from 18 metres. Um, I think we can also say that, that um, it, as well as high-rise housing, uh, that we're already made changes around other types of buildings, entertainment, assembly buildings, care homes, hospitals, etc., uh, uh, in order to, to address cladding issues. Can I, can I just uh, put this on the record? And uh, Mr Garvin has covered it um, to a point, but my officials are not aware not aware of any external wall cladding system tested to BS8414 uh, that has failed in actual um, fire incidents. And I think, you know, the fact that others who are looking um, at uh, bringing in uh, new standards are basing um, that on BS8414. I reiterate what I was saying about um, the European Harmonised Fire Test Standard. Um, it is uh, on the basis uh, of 8414 that they're moving forward and it is uh, respected globally. Um, now, you know, I know um, as always uh, that there are sometimes differing views, but I think, um, you know, we should await and see exactly uh, what the British Standards Institution uh, comes up with in terms of their findings and all of this. But as uh, I, 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 I can't say enough. We are not aware of any external cladding system 
uh, that has been tested to be S8414 uh, that has failed any in, in, in any actual fire incidents. But it's it's because this test, and I know we're getting technical here, but, but this test can allow materials which have limited combustibility to be used in, 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 in systems. And it's because of that that it's not being is no longer being used in the rest of the uh, mainland Britain. Would it not be sensible, despite all all that you've said, to at least put a pause on this until we can be absolutely certain it's safe? Uh, convener, uh, I want to do everything possible to make sure that folk are safe in their homes, um, but I, and I, I I I will do everything possible to ensure that that's the case. Um, but I don't want to take a knee-jerk reaction um, and ban something where quite clearly, you know, the evidence that there is at this moment with that full-scale fire test that is carried out, um, we haven't seen incidents. Um, and uh, you cannot repeat that enough in the fact that, you know, we are unaware of any incident in any system which is con conformed to BS84. Um, one four. Beyond that, I think we've got to recognise um, that experts elsewhere are actually looking to build their own regime on the back of BS eight four one four. You know, if if um, if there was a situation uh, whereby nobody um, recognised this um, test of being of value, then yeah, um, you know, I would have looked at um, something differently in terms of uh, the advice given. But, you know, what we have is an uh, a, a panel, an uh, independent review panel, who have backed BS8414. Uh, we have a situation where the European Commission are looking at building uh, on uh, BS8414, using that as the basis for their harmonisation. Uh, and we have... Um, as is rightly so, that review ongoing by the British Standards Institu Institution into it to see if further improvement um, is required. I think, you know, I'm not averse uh, to, to making uh, change, but I think we need to find out from the experts what is actually required in that front. Okay, just one, one more question. It's a quick question, convener. Thanks very much. Um, just on this, um, and it's really flows from what Professor Torero told us uh, around this test. His concern was um, not, not necessarily around the test, but the people using the test and uh, sometimes a lack of skills. So how, how do we ensure that the people actually using the test have the right skills to A, carry out the test, and B, to interpret the results? I think no matter what, whether, whether it be in, in this area of fire safety or any other construction area, one of the things that we've got to do is to make sure that we've got the right people uh, carrying out whatever job of work um, is uh, required. Um, and, you know, uh, that is one of the reasons why, you know, we continue to look at every single aspect um, all, of all of this. And obviously we have to um, cooperate uh, conjole and maybe even move further um, in terms of getting everyone involved uh, in the construction business into the place where you know we have the level of reliability that we all expect. Now I'll bring in Mr Garvin for some of the technical aspects of this and I'll, I'll maybe come back and be So uh, again I think having the, the right skills whether it's in design or or installation work is, is prerequisite. And uh, I think whilst uh, the, the uh, work is going on, as, as I mentioned earlier, to look at skills, licensing contractors, etc., within the construction industry, and that's something that we monitor and liaise on uh, as, as we go, is how do we use that within the building standard system, uh, I think is, imp is important. Um, but I think that, that's not to say that there, is, there isn't already people who are skilled in the design of facades of all types, and uh, it, it's about getting the right the right people uh, who are actually carrying out the design work. So um, 
the, the, there's a range of kind of industry uh, um, approaches here. Uh, the, uh, there isn't, I suppose, one uh, profession which is in charge of the, the, the cladding on a building or the facade building. It's a mixture of architecture, engineering, surveyors, etc. Uh, because so, my question was around this test and the people using the test, and how can we be absolutely certain that those people have the right skills to use the tests and interpret the results. Now, if we're, if we're not doing it, just say we're not doing it, and then we can find a way to, to actually do, do that, do what's required. Okay, so um, I think it's it, it, the, uh, I suppose, in terms of who's carrying out the work, as we said earlier, it's very much around those responsibilities of people instructing work, the clients, uh, and, and their advisors to ensure that the uh, contractors and subcontractors of the uh, and the designers have the expertise to uh, to carry out this work. I think um, uh, Mr. Garvin has not quite answered Mr. Simpson's question because his system, his question is based uh, around the test itself. Um, if it's useful, <coughs> we can provide uh, information around about the. Uh, BRE testing and uh, and uh, uh, and other aspects of all of that. I don't know if you could answer some of that sh straight off. So I think the uh, it's, it's clear that the uh, the the system that is tested to eight four one four should be uh, that 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 should be the basis of what's put on a building. So the the design and construction of it, and I think veering too far from that uh, should not be allowed. So. Uh, as well as the 8414 test, there is the BS 9414 uh, uh, rules for uh, application of the, the, the test as well. So as well as following the, using the system that's tested, it's, it's using those sets of rules. Sorry, this, the question's not really being answered. Maybe you don't have the answer today, but can you go away and have a look at you know, how, how this is monitored have a look at the evidence we took last time, especially from Pro Professor Torero. This was his main concern, uh, and it's certainly my concern if we're going to continue to use this test, where, where there is a difference of views over whether this test is any good or not. But if it's go we're going to carry on using it in Scotland, we need to be sure that the people who are using it and interpreting the results are properly skilled. Now, well, if we're not... I think the, the straightforward question that Graham wants answered is who ensures that the people who are doing the test can do the test appropriately and properly? Yeah. So, so the, the tests themselves should, be, uh, should have accreditation. So uh, the test rigs and, and those carrying out the work. Um, and there will be, uh, the, the, for example, UCAS accreditation. Uh, and UCAS will publish uh, the, the laboratories who uh, have accreditation to carry out the test. So, for example, BRE. So, uh, yeah. what, what, what we can do is, um, uh, and I think maybe the committee has seen some of this before, um, is look at some of the testing um, that is done, for example, at BRE, so that you've got an indication of, of what the accreditation is and what they, what they do. And, and assurance that only people who have got that accreditation do those tests. That, I think that would answer We, the we, we will send you that detail, convener. Right. Thank you. Okay. Right, thank you, yeah, Andy? Thanks very much, uh, convener and welcome, Minister. Um, so I want to talk about the issue you mentioned um, in your opening remarks about um, cladding and uh, owners. Um, this is a wider question that we've been discussing so far. This fundamentally is about risk and to what extent particularly lenders are willing to take on risks. Um, now, it is welcome, of course, at the end of December, the EWS uh, form uh, was published, which is an agreement between the Building Society Association, RACS, and UK Finance, which is a form intended for recording in a consistent manner what assessments have been made uh, to external wall con constructions. And to that extent, obviously, if an assessment's been made and everything's tickety-boo, then everything's fine. Further problems will arise where an assessment's been made and everything is not uh, in order and further work's required. That further work, uh, further investigation may prove that things are okay or it may 
show that remediation uh, is required. Now, there's a number of problems that have been highlighted by the Law Society for Scotland, and I just uh, quote you um, a, a, a note they published just before Christmas, which is um, that professional indemnity insurers, in other words, the people who insure solicitors and surveyors themselves, will not provide cover for a report addressed to all owners. Therefore, any report is only um, to be relied upon by the particular owner of that bit of the external wall uh, and the lender uh, in question. So I suppose my question is, have you got any ability to assist in this regard um, by, for example, underwriting any of this work um, or not? Because as many members know, they have constituents who are currently unable to sell flats because they either cannot afford to uh, get this uh, assessment done, or even if it uh, is done, uh, they may require remedial works. Uh, and anybody else who then sells a, a flat, maybe the neighbour, requires to do it all over again with all those associated costs. I just wonder if you can give some indication about you know, what you're able to do. Um, convener, uh, I am aware of the situation, as Mr Whiteman knows. Um, and uh, this is something that basically uh, sprung up in, in, in uh, the autumn uh, of last year. Um, I have, uh, of course, as I've uh, told Parliament previously, uh, written to the UK government on these issues. Um, I've written to um, uh, Robert Jenrick a number of times uh, and have still uh, to yet to receive a response uh, from the Secretary of State uh, on this particular issue. And obviously the um, uh, mortgage uh, lending uh, aspect of all of this um, is a, a reserved matter and I would have thought that at the very least we uh, would have had the courtesy of a, a response uh, around about some of the concerns uh, that we have put forward. Um, it may well be convener, uh, although it's not for me to tell the committee uh, what to do, it may well be that you want to add your voices, because uh, I know a number of other colleagues in this place um, and colleagues uh, uh, in the UK Parliament, uh, including Deirdre Brock, have uh, tried to raise this uh, issue with Mr. Uh, Jen Rick too, and I've yet to find anyone uh, who has uh, received a, a response. Um, as I said um, uh, in my uh, answer, uh, in my opening remarks, convener. Um, the uh, form EWS1 uh, hopefully uh, will make some difference um, in terms of uh, moving forward. Um, but uh, I think that uh, what is required here um, is uh, a solution um, that works uh, for all. Uh, so we will continue discussions uh, with uh, the UK Finance uh, with the uh, Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors um, and with others um, around about how we can move forward in this front. Uh, we will also, uh, of course, continue to engage with the likes of the Property uh, Managers Association uh, too. Um, I uh, have said to Mr uh, Whiteman previously um, that uh, I, in my intention uh, was to bring a number of folk together uh, to brainstorm how we could uh, uh, get through some of the, the difficulties that we have here. Uh, but the key thing would be to get a response uh, from the UK government on this issue um, so that we know exactly uh, what uh, we uh, can do, uh, obviously, within um, uh, devolved powers. Uh, in terms of how serious I take this, I um, am responding to every single person who is writing to me on this subject so that I've got a, a, an idea of where there are difficulties, uh, what difficulties folk are facing in all of this. Uh, and the committee can be assured that as we progress, um, I will continue to keep you, continue to keep you updated um, of how uh, we move forward in this front. There are issues that the UK government can assist with in this regard, but I, I don't think one of them is 
telling mortgage lenders that they must lend to people that they don't want to lend to. But I'm sure there are issues there. But in terms of your responsibilities, does one issue here not relate to the, the law of the tenement and the fact that if uh, one owner, for example, if, if, it's, if it's deemed that remedial works are required, um, those works become just as difficult to remedy potential defects in cladding as they would in terms of any maintenance required to a tenement, or indeed, as we were just discussing uh, earlier in an earlier agenda item, um, the question of uh, adapting a common parts. So, is this is not that that question is, is fully within the uh, devolved space? Is it not? I think uh, in all of this, uh, convener, uh, what you cannot do here is separate all of these things out. The main difficulty that there is at present. Um, is around about <laughs> mortgage lending. Um, and, you know, one of the things about all of this is I have no powers over mortgage lending. That rests with the UK Secretary <coughs> of State. Um, and, you know, I think in, in all of this, you know, um, in order uh, to get this absolutely right, uh, and Mr Whiteman has talked earlier on about whether we can underwrite this, that, or the other. Well, I'm not in a, a position at this moment in time uh, to say what we can or cannot do uh, in some of these regards. One of the things which frustrates me greatly is when this place um, tries to attempt um, to do half a job rather than resolve the full job. And in order to resolve the full job here, we need some cooperation from the UK government in terms of how we move forward in aspects of this. Okay, I'm, I'm still not clear what role the UK government has in here. I understand that a mortgage finance is a reserved matter, but UK finance and the building societies have got together with our RCS to agree a common form of assessment. The questions arise about taking that forward. And the questions I've got are about people who find themselves in a position where, for example, the assessor is signing off on, on B2 of the form, or, or indeed B1, where further work uh, either is required or remedial work is required. And the problems associated with the fact that the work that is done and the inspections that are done, uh, no one else can rely upon them. So they're nothing to do with UK finance. We're talking about a situation where mortgage lenders are perfectly happy to lend uh, if certain requirements are met. But if you've got nothing further to say on that, that's... That's, that's, uh, that's fine. I, I, if I could just say, convener, um, you know, uh, I I know that Mr. Whiteman um, uh, said at committee uh, the other week, and I paraphrase here, let's leave the world of reality. I cannot leave the world of reality in terms of trying to find uh, some of the solutions uh, that are required here. Now, obviously, um, what I would be very grateful for is if the committee itself would add the pressure uh, that been, has been put on uh, by others around about the UK government's role in this. You know, uh, I've written to Mr. Jenrick in October, uh, in December, comprehensive letters, with a lot of follow-ups, including a follow-up this week. Um, and in order to get this absolutely right for all involved, uh, we require that cooperation uh, because it's not worth doing half the job or a situation where we have to mitigate uh, completely and utterly for uh, things that the UK government have responsibility for and seem unwilling uh, to, to help us uh, in terms of dealing with that. Okay, well, I, I don't recognise the Minister's paraphrasing of any of my words in committee, but... Um, course of the period what poverty, is, but... Aside, and um, the fact the, the the lost sight have drawn attention to the fact that there is a big difficulty in Scotland about how a block is owned, and for example, factors do not have the power to commission a report without an approval of the majority of co-owners. Now, I agree that we shouldn't be doing half a job, absolutely, and I perfectly f agree with you that. To, to the extent that the UK government can help here, it should do, and it should do pronto. Um, but the other half of the job, if it's half or a quarter or two thirds, I don't know, also needs to be attended to. Um, so how a block is owned and whether factors have the power to commission a report without the approval of the majority of co-owners, that's up to us, isn't it? Uh, the way that ESW1 was put together is not necessarily the way that I would do it. Um, and as Mr. Uh, Whiteman is well aware, 
uh, in terms of how we deal with co-ownership in terms of tenements. Um, the working group that uh, has uh, done a job of work here in Parliament uh, put forward a, a number of recommendations which I have responded to. Uh, Mr Whiteman uh, recognises, I'm sure, as do others in that group, um, that sometimes you kind of find simplistic solutions to uh, some of these things. And we have a job of work uh, to do in that front, which we have said uh, we will uh, do in terms of using uh, the Scottish uh, Law Commission and others to get us to a place where we can resolve uh, some of the, uh, the difficulties that there have been in terms of ownership over the piece. Okay, another, another area that's in the devolved space is the additional dwelling supplement and the fact that we've got constituents who've paid the additional dwelling supplement but clearly are not going to be able to reclaim it because they're never going to be able to sell the property uh, within the 18 months required. Are you considering any legislative adjustments to those arrangements? Uh, I have not seen any situation like that. If Mr Whiteman uh, wants to uh, send me any details of that, um, that's something that... Uh, uh, I will certainly look at and, uh, okay. and talk to colleagues about. Okay, and, and finally, I just want to ask a question about the inventory of high-rise buildings. Yeah. Um, when you were here in September 2018, you, spec you expected this to be complete with the next few, within the next few weeks, uh, i.e. the end of 2018. Now, um, I think as we discussed in Parliament in November just last year, you intimated that there'd been some difficulty in getting that complete. Can you give us an update? Um, um, convener, I think that the inventory task was uh, much greater than uh, most folk um, anticipated. Um, the inventory itself has been uh, uh, developed to provide a, a central uh, a source of information uh, and uh, an overview of all of the domestic high-rise uh, buildings in Scotland, including all of the um, fire safety uh, features. Um, the data gathering exercise uh, has been undertaken uh, and uh, local authorities, building standards departments uh, were contacted just before Christmas uh, for uh, a final opportunity to address any outstanding um, uh, data or and to verify uh, the data which has already been provided. Um, the deadline for all of these checks is the end of this month uh, and the inventory itself uh, will be considered at the next meeting of the ministerial working group uh, which takes place on the 4th of February. And presumably when you've been sending these leaflets out you're using the draft results from the inventory to, yeah. to do that? Yeah. Okay. And in terms of high rise, just sorry, one small question. High rise, is it eleven metres or eighteen metres in the inventory height? Eighteen. Eighteen. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, could I ask you just further to your responses, could you send us a copy of the letter you've sent to the Minister? It'd be helpful for us if we were going to be drafting that. Um letter. in terms of the, the communications I've had with Mr Jenrick, I'm happy to uh, share that with the committee. That'd be very um, and the follow-up emails and things that have been uh, have been sent. Yeah, uh, and just for the record, we uh, invited UK Finance, the old Council of Mortgage Lenders, to the committee, but they said they couldn't attend for a reason that we don't really recognise. Uh, so. Obviously, I kind of speak for um, UK no, Finance, no. Uh, convener, but, you know, I think in, uh, in all of this to resolve things as we move forward, um, folk should be uh, willing to talk and be open and transparent about it, okay. in thank my you. opinion. Uh, okay, thank you. Can I ask you, it was touched on just in the very, the very last question there, I suppose, but can, can you provide an update on the action taken to implement the recommendations of the Hackett Coal and Stollard reports? Oh, gosh. Um, that's... Uh, that's uh, well, uh, well, I'll tell you what, maybe what you could do then is just send it to us. The, you, your, what your response to that, the recommendations? I, I, I think, um, convener, it would be much better uh, if we outlaid exactly how we have moved forward uh, in all of this. Um, uh, you know, obviously, um, we've paid uh, due attention to uh, Dame Judith Hackett's report as well um, as our own independent um, reviews. 
um, and officials uh, here have continued to talk to um, uh, Dame Judith because um, you know uh, uh, we want to ensure that we are doing everything that we possibly can. Um, and, and making sure that her golden thread, I think, as she used quite a lot, um, is uh, the way that we go forward. Um, we'll, we'll send you details of every single element rather than me go yeah, through, going through what, and pieces. What, what could be about 20 pages can be now, I think. Yes, please send it. Uh, Sarah? Yeah, I think from our perspective that will be useful because there are probably one or two of us that are getting letters from our constituents, particularly about mortgages and what happens next. So any feedback back we have as to what progress is being made in timescales would be useful because there are now people not able to move or sell their flats. In terms of that, I'm more than happy um, if Miss Boyack wants to write me a note, uh, we'll yeah. let you, you know, uh, there have been a, a number of colleagues who have been in touch, uh, mainly from uh, the, um, the Aberdeen Edinburgh and in, 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 uh, in Glasgow um, and you know as I say um, I've responded to every single letter uh, that we've had from individuals as well because I feel uh, it, it's important that I do so uh, I would say that those letters are in the tens the tens um, um, but you know uh, I, I'm more than willing to, uh, to to chat to folk around about where they think there may be difficulties <coughs> in their particular patches, uh, because obviously the key thing in all of this um, is to try and resolve this, uh, because there are people out there um, who are suffering at this moment because they cannot move. Okay. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, convener. Minister, you spoke about at the beginning of the meeting in, in your in your opening about properties being as safe as they can be and I think that would be all our uh, intent uh, to ensure that but can I go back to the the policy about staying put and evacuation uh, and some of the the areas around that uh, because you know we 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 are all well aware that when Grenfell happened and the and the reports that came out from Grenfell it talked about uh, in the case of some high-rise buildings it will be necessary for buildings owners and fire rescue uh, to provide a greater range of options, uh, uh, and that could be partial uh, or full evacuation. Uh, and also, it, it talked about uh, the managing of the trans, uh, transition from stay put to get out, uh, when it, and they would be deemed necessary. So can I ask a number of questions with reference to that and uh, our own Scottish and Fire Rescue Service itself? Uh, can I ask if you intend to sponsor research or into the effectiveness of stay put uh, guidance uh, issued by the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service for individuals who live in high-rise property. Okay. Um, I, I, in terms of some of the uh, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service questions, if it becomes an operational question, convener, um, I may be able to touch upon it, um, but I may ask to get SFRS SFRS to write to you mm -hmm. if I uh, don't have uh, the detail here. Uh, in terms of um, the stay put um, policy, uh, the National Fire Chiefs Council um, is working with the UK Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government uh, to meet and to formulate a research programme into the stay put policy. Uh, the Scottish uh, Fire and Rescue Service is cited on this work uh, through uh, their uh, participation in the NFCC work streams, which uh, is the norm. Uh, the government are, are uh, going to keep abreast of all of that research uh, so that we can quickly uh, consider and act on any learning uh, that uh, may come up uh, as part of that ongoing examination of stay put. And, you know, we, we've already discussed today that the, the ideas of modifications that's taken place within buildings uh, and the, the whole idea of the, the policy to remain within that. Uh, and when we've had uh, some discussion already about uh, the compartmentalisation that's taken place across that, and that, that in itself uh, could be compromising some individuals in that whole process. Uh, and your views on that would be quite useful as well. Uh, as I said earlier, um, convener, we've had cooperation uh, from local authorities, housing associations, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, 
um, uh, around about uh, that look see to see if uh, if there uh, is uh, a situation anywhere where you know the a door has been replaced that shouldn't have been replaced uh, uh, and uh, and all of the rest of it. Uh, I know uh, that from my own mailbox, um, you know uh, that work seems to have been very very comprehensive, and the fact that I've had a, a number of folk. Uh, who replace doors, their own front doors yep. um, themselves without um, a, a buyer leave uh, are now faced with uh, a bill for removal mm -hmm. uh, and for the installation uh, of uh, the required uh, door as per building standards. So councils, housing associations, the fire and rescue service have all been reporting these things and we are seeing differences. And one of the things around about the inventory um, is, you know, the ability to do that uh, that check to make sure that as folk are coming back with um, uh, with any changes to the inventory or any yep. uh, uh, or, 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 or any additional things that you know that check is there to make sure um, you know that this is going on. This is something that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service do on a day and daily basis. Um, and, and buildings. Now, while I'm no expert in all that they do, um, what I do know is that they pick up on a huge amount of things as they go about um, checking. And I expect local authorities, housing associations and others to do the same. Yeah, and I, and I think that that is a very valid point. Uh, and the, the campaign that has been launched uh, throughout uh, uh, associations, councils and the fire rescue service themselves about trying to inform and keep people abreast of the situation. And you've talked already today about some of the literature that you've been sending out to try and capture uh, and ensure uh, that, that, that everybody is aware uh, of what the, uh, the campaign is and the common threads that come within that campaign, and also about the, the safety and, and highlighting uh, some of the concerns and what they should be trying to do themselves. Uh, to ensure uh, that they have. So that takes away the anxiety and that takes away some of the, the difficulties that some people have, 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 have seen. So can I ask about the campaign? We've already gone into giving us today some idea about the, the, the number of literature and leaflets that's gone out and all of that, and that's very much welcome. Uh, but the responses coming back and the, the feedback, uh, uh, how, how has that been uh, uh, implemented and how is that being processed? Um, can I hand over to Mr Booth, please? So uh, the feedback we've had so far has only been anecdotal, because um, as you'll appreciate, they've not all gone out so far. Um, but we're commissioning research at the end of the month yep. for, for uh, research to, to go out to a number of buildings uh, and carry out interviews with residents to ask questions around, did they receive the leaflet? Yep. Um, what do they think of the information that is in the leaflet? Do they, do they feel safer now that they've read the information? What continuing concerns do they have? Um, if we look to amend or update the leaflet in the future, what information would they find helpful in there? It, it was largely around public reassurance. What, what we heard from Grenfell is there had been people who lived in that building for 20 years who'd never received fire safety yeah. information. Um, the information that's in our leaflet is, has uh, come about from responses that we got from our public consultation, but also public engagement events that we've had yeah. with members of the public uh, and our tenants of residence panel, which is made up of... Uh, a number of people who live in high-rise flats of, of mixed tenure. Um, so it's hoped that it's as helpful as, as possible. It contains information on how to prevent fires, what to do in the event of a fire. Um, what people would ask for is, is they said to us, we understand stay put, we understand that we, we should stay, stay in, our build, in, in our flat, but we don't really understand why it's safe to stay in the flat. So the leaflet tries to set out exactly what compartmentation is about and why it should work sh if the building has been you know, built correctly. Um, and also provides contact information for the fire and rescue service and, and, well. and that's backed up by the the, the fire safety visits that, that a number of the uh, the fire service do to ensure that that buildings and flats etc are uh, being looked at because as we've said in the past uh, you know the common areas that can be sometimes uh, that people fly tip or they leave things <coughs> that create uh, as well it's not it's not just the the physical aspects of the building itself it's what has been added or what's been left or what's been uh, and that in itself needs to be addressed uh, in in this whole process uh, and i think that 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 is something else you're looking at in the whole in the whole idea of making sure the consultation takes place yeah okay. I, I think convener um in terms of mr stewart's point about fire safety visits 
Uh, I think that you know uh, we uh, should uh, give plaudits where they're due uh, in terms of the amount of fire safety visits uh, that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service did in high-rise buildings directly after the tragedy at Grenfell. Um, I know that Ms Ewing um, is, is well aware as the former minister. The level of cooperation that there was was phenomenal. Um, and, you know, there were people out there who had concerns um, and the, uh, the fire and safety teams across the country did a sterling job of work um, in ensuring that they were giving folk the right advice. And in some cases, um, just that assurance. Can I just ask a follow-up to that? Is there are any plans for the Scottish Government to ask the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service to change its fire safety guidance to high-rise flats, tenants? Um, we, look at, uh, we look at guidance uh, on a regular basis. Do you have an answer to that? In, in, what, res in what respect? Well, uh, uh, is there particular, cons you know, is there particular guidance required for high-rise? It maybe wasn't now that we know about Grenfell and other things, there particular guidance required for high-rise residents that wasn't required before, or is there particular guidance for high-rise residents that isn't required in, in other properties? Convener, um, in terms of guidance, um, and I am just, this is not my, uh, mm. my area, but I, I, I think I do have, um, I, I know that there has been some changes to, to guidance uh, in recent times, and if you'll bear with me, uh, because I'll have to read some of this, uh, I'm afraid. Um, I'm, I'm more than happy uh, to, to do so, um, but there have been a number of things which um, uh, uh, have come from the Ministerial Working Group which were agreed, um, and that includes specific fire safety guidance which was aimed at all residents, which is th th this programme, um, and of course all of that is out. Um, introduction of Scottish guidance concerning fire safety in purpose-built uh, blocks of flats, which was published um, in December. Um, introduction of guidance concerning fire risk assessments, also published um, in December. Um, also, there have been uh, a look at consistent positions regarding the storage, removal uh, and enforced prohibition uh, of combustible materials uh, in common areas. Again, uh, that was dealt with uh, in December. Uh, the campaign um, is ongoing, will be followed uh, by uh, another one, which is uh, uh, scheduled, I think, for February uh, 2020. Um, and there will also be introduction of Scottish guidance concerning fire safety in specialised housing, uh, and that's due to be published in, early, uh, in the early part of this year. Can, can I ask just then, who has control over the guidance? Is it, is it the government or is it the Fire and Rescue Service? Um, I would bow to Mr Booth in that. For, for guidance for mm -hmm. people who manage high-rise domestic buildings? Guidance, guidance directed at people who manage. Yeah, the stay put guidance. The this stay put guidance would that be that in control of the SFIS, or would it be? I, I think we need to get back to you on that. I, I, I think that would be okay. under the operational jurisdiction of SFRS, and I see uh, Ms Ewing nodding there, so I, 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 I may be right there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I would say that's operational. And as I said to Mr Stewart, you know, we're looking uh, with others. Um, uh, the re uh, uh, and research it uh, uh, at Stapeout. But in terms of this, I would rather that you got uh, a more robust answer from SFRS uh, rather than than, than me yeah, that, uh, that maybe going great. off and one which may not be quite right. No, I appreciate that, Minister. Annabelle, would you want to come yeah. in on something I mean, else? I, 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 in fact, the Minister went on to list a number of things I had recalled were you know, in play in terms of, of uh, further... Guidance. I think the point is well made that actually uh, we really need to hear from the SFRS themselves because quite a number of times now we have got to this point uh, and we need the answer really from them. So. Okay, uh, okay, thank you for that. Annabelle, have you got a question around? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you, Convener. So uh, turning to the issue of uh, the smoke, heat and carbon monoxide detectors and the requirement to have the integrated system in place from February 2021, I know that in committee not 
so uh, uh, not so far, far away in the dim distant past we actually had a, an SSI on this. But just picking up a few points, um, the Minister said in his opening remarks that, uh, in fact, uh, there's an interest-free loan uh, system in place to help uh, with uh, uh, to help social uh, uh, landlords, uh, social housing associations, thank you. Um, so, uh, and that the, the drawdown thus far had been 4.5 million. Uh, is that kind of where the minister expected it to be? That seems it's, everybody's getting, certainly it's, it's encouraging that people are actually, you know, ahead of the curve and, and preparing for this, but is that where you, the minister had expected that drawdown to be at this stage or? Um, that's difficult for me to judge really. Um, uh, there was, uh, you know, a, a, a number of uh, housing associations who were already doing things to that standard. Um, there were, will be other housing associations um, uh, that will pay for this um, from uh, uh, their uh, resources as is. Um, what we did uh, was we listened to uh, a number of housing associations who thought that, that there may be uh, some stickiness in terms of uh, of getting to that point um, within uh, the resource that they had available at that point, and that's why we put the um, loan scheme in place. It has uh, it has it, it worked, it seems, uh, and we'll continue to uh, to review and see um, exactly where that leads us to. And you know, um, if required, we may have to find some other uh, resource to. to to top up that loan scheme. Okay. Um, the, can I just to clarify, the interest-free loans are available to to whom specifically? To, to housing associations. Housing associations. Okay. Uh, and uh, in terms then of um, non-housing associations, um, uh, uh, what uh, information has been um, promulgated to ensure that everybody is aware that they have? The requirement to meet this deadline by February 2021. Um, How is that information campaign? Uh, convener, we'll uh, do as best as we possibly can, as always, to try and ensure uh, that information um, uh, gets out there uh, to folks. One of the things which um, uh, was highlighted uh, to me just the other day um, in my own constituency um, is that there was a, a leaflet uh, that somebody had picked up uh, around about um, the the the, the uh, fire and smoke detectors, um, and I was questioned around about uh, whether this sales leaflet, as was, whether um, these uh, materials that were being sold actually complied with the legislation. So I think we have a, a job of work to do to make sure, uh, as well, that there is nobody out there. Uh, unscru unscrupulously uh, try to sell products that do not comply um, with the legislation. So I don't think it's even just a case of highlighting uh, what needs to be done. I think we also have to make sure that folks out there know what product it is that's required to comply. So I think we've got a job of work to do there, uh, but it's not just the getting out of the new legislation, it's also making sure that no unscrupulous people take advantage of folk uh, as we make these changes. Okay, well, that's that's good to know. Um, in terms of uh, an issue that arose uh, in our evidence session in November that's already been referred to, there was a concern that, and dealing therefore with your comment about the, 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 the requirement to comply exactly with the legislation in terms of product, but there was a, a concern that um, we could get a lot of false positives if uh, there wasn't a, a high-quality, sort of smart... Uh, uh, approach to these detectors. Um, I, I don't know what there would be in terms of uh, solving that. I would imagine that that's not required in terms of the legislation. So to have a very high spec product so that there's not a, a kind of uh, constant uh, triggering of, of alarms that are yes. not triggered as a result of any fire I, 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 or I, gas incident. Uh, indeed. Um, Let's let's put it this way. I th I think you know in terms of the product that we've products that we've outlined, um, you know, um, they they would be uh, high spec anyway. I know exactly where um, uh, Ms. Ewing is coming from, uh, because uh, with older smoke detectors, um, I think it would be fair to say um, that uh, I was often uh, given into trouble. Uh, for my cooking skills or lack of them uh, because every th time I did anything 
I set out the smoke detector, set off the smoke detectors uh, in uh, in our house. But you know what, where we're at now is much more advanced than that. And in the um, in in the flat that I rent here in Edinburgh, um, where I continue to uh, burn things while I'm cooking, um, the smoke detectors do not go off because um, you know um, there's a, a greater recognition now than what there was previously. This should be a Kevin setting. Um, no, I'm not. Uh, I'm just saying that they're much better than they once were. Um, I, 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 I've, nobody will want to marry me now that I've just said that I'm such a bad cook. Eh? I'm not really. Not that bad. This is not one of these dial-a-date <laughs> uh, meetings. Well, I was just going to suggest, convener, maybe next Christmas, right, a okay. cooking book for the minister. Yeah. Might. I think that's probably... But can I just say also, I was very reassured by the, the technical information that yes, we good. also got amongst the burnt cooking. And, and I think that's probably the perfect place to stop <laughs> with the, the minister asking for a... <laughs> A partner. <laughs> yes, exactly. I wasn't begging for a proposal. There. <laughs> could be okay. On uh, on that note, can I thank Kevin Stewart and his supporting officials for attending today's session? Uh, that concludes the public part of today's meeting, and I now move the meeting into private. Thank you. Thank you.